Thanks, the organizers, uh, uh, Tuhin, Amol, Shirup, and uh, Rick. Right, I was just <laughs> right, and Rick for inviting me. And uh, okay, today I'm going to talk about some fluorescent BSM physics. Um, most of the thing. Okay, the main spoiler alert is there has been no signal for BSM physics. Okay, so that's the main spoiler alert. Uh, so. I've been asked to talk about um, um, report on BSM physics, but it's a very, very, very vast area. So let me start with a simple question about uh, why BSM physics? We have several reasons and these motivations remain pretty strong. So you have neutrino masses, dark matter, all of these things, fermion masses, flavor, hierarchy problem, which I think Jan gave a fantastic talk this morning and then quantum gravity, hierarchy of the forces, so on, so on. So these motivations remain strong, but uh, so with these motivations, one can construct a lot of new physics. So there are several of these new physics, supersymmetry, composite Higgs, vector fermions, Randall syndrome, UED, clockworks, string landscapes, cosmological solutions, relaxions, all of these things. Actually. There are quite a few, and I don't think I'll be able to cover any of them many of these things actually. So I'll choose, so I'll cherry pick a few things which I like, okay, which I'll stick to, which are natural. So something like I'll give one example of natural phenomena and one example without naturalness, and then I'll try to play. So, so typically we have this <laughs> feature that supersymmetry is dead. So many people, whenever I talk to people, they say, okay, supersymmetry is dead. Why are you still looking at it? Why are you working on it? But perhaps it's just heavy, and uh, that's visual thinking. We don't know. So if it is heavy, so but it low energy Susi is constrained by various things. Higgs mass is a very important constraint. LHC results, dark matter, and flavor. I'll quickly go through all of these things in a second. Actually, the Higgs mass puts a very strong constraint on the uh, soft sector of the supersymmetry, especially of the stop sector. So as you can see from this graph. Uh, for a 125 GeV Higgs, you need to have either a very large mixing, maximal mixing in the stop sector, or these stops should dry really at 10 TeV range or something. Very, very heavy. Okay, if they are light, they, are, uh, they had to be uh, heavily mixed. And if they are heavily mixed, then we have these questions about, again, you can ask the same questions about like in what in, uh, uh, they're subject to charge and color breaking minima. And you have the same questions of stability, metastability, and criticality of the Higgs in terms of this trilinear coupling in, uh, uh, in supersymmetric scenario, very similar to what happens in standard model, actually. And then we have the LSC results. The LSC results are uh, very strongly uh, divided into uh, the colored sector and the uncolored sector. So here is the colored sector limits from Atlas. So they're already touching 2.2 TeV. This is the compressed region. And here in the stop sector, it's around one TeV. Similarly, the sleptonic sector is uh, slightly better. Uh, this is an updated graph uh, with uh, G minus two results also. Okay, but for the present, let's just say it's around touching around 600 to 700 GeV. So, to summarize, uh, the gluinos are around 2 TeV. First two generations should be much greater, around, 2 TV, around the same level, essentially 1.2 2 TeV. Third generation limits are already touching around 1 TeV. And weakly coupled particle limits are becoming stronger, reaching around half a TeV and 1 TeV in some cases, actually. But you should remember these limits are obtained in simplified models, and so there could be variations in this schema. Now, if you look at uh, the flavor, uh, flavor, I just took it from Kalibis and I just took the strongest limits coming from mu going to E gamma and mu E conversions and everything. So here again, these are uh, limits from uh, simplified models. And you see that flavor violation puts really strong constraints uh, uh, on the flavor violating parameters around 500, uh, uh, around 10 power minus five. So if you invert it, it pushes to be around 30 TeV to 100 TeV in the slept on masses essentially. So these are, so that means that if you take order one flavor violation, you have to push these masses to be around 
100 TV to uh, or so 10 TV to 100 TV range essentially. So then, if you have dark matter, you have if you have a pure Higgsino or a pure Vino, the limits are pretty strong. There are about one TV or so, and if you have a pure Vino, it's pretty large unless you have some admixture of Vino 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 Higgsino etc. for a dark matter. So in summary, uh, typically you seem to be having all the limits, all the constraints coming from Higgs, direct limits, uh, direct searches like LHC, dark matter, flavor, everything seems to be pushing the scale of supersymmetry pretty high. Pretty high. Here is the dark matter results again, essentially. It is still possible to have, just as a caveat, like I said, it's still possible to have some light sector in the weak sector. Okay, this is in, I, I'm showing three examples here. So one is with uh, PMSSM with mu greater than zero, which has also G minus two solution. Here with, uh, with a mu less than zero. So it's a pretty light neutralino, it's still allowed. And here, this is in CMSSM. And I was actually very surprised to see this result because they have a non-zero solution. And this required, uh, this in April funnel region. And they had a very thin strip here where you can have uh, the dark matter consistent actually. Do light Pardon? Do light uh, these are all fine tuned, yes. I mean, the in dark matter region. Okay. Heavy supersymmetry typically means little bit more fine tuning than what we have actually. So, uh, so if you look at what are the possible spectra taking all these constraints into consideration, so it looks like we have some sort of uh, splitting. Okay, uh, these splittings could be with large fine tuning, like in split supersymmetry, very large fine tuning essentially, or with uh, this is essentially no solution, it's an unnatural sort of thing. And here also there is some, some amount of fine tuning, but not as big as this one. But there is it's called PV scale supersymmetry. You can have old decoupled like scenario in the first two generations, which are pretty heavy and the, light, uh, the third generation a bit light. And you can also have mini split supersymmetry also around 10, 10 power two, 10 power four or so also. So the splitting seems to be of the colored particles seems to be the common feature. The colored particles, colored scalars and gluino perhaps are split compared to the weak spectrum. So the weakly coupled particles are sort of uh, have a loop factor in mass difference compared to the colored sector, essentially, roughly the, that's the basic idea, yeah. Uh, some regions, you're right, that some regions uh, make it uh, tachyonic, but some regions you can make it still work, actually. Yeah, the two loop running of the uh, things will make them, uh, some of the S particles tachyonic. Right, exactly, that, that the third generation will make it tachyonic, actually. But it could it still work, actually. There are regions in which it could still work. Uh, especially if you have some flavor violation in the third generation. So what happens is this one splits. So one of them is pretty heavy and one of them is a bit light. And so you can have regions in which you can have. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. This one just went down. <laughs> it's always there, essentially. So with the Higgs template is always there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, while this was the lower, uh, uh, there has been a revival. There has been a revival of uh, renewed interest in supersymmetry uh, due to the confirmation of the Fermi lab result in G minus two of the muon. Several groups have looked into it, and. Uh, this regions, so this, this region, okay, there are a lot of colored regions here, but these all these colored regions are corresponding to various the direct detection um, constraints coming from uh, of the dark matter. This particular region is the one which is consistent with G minus two, this small gray regions, this region, okay. So it requires, uh, so this region is slightly compressed. So there is a compression in the, uh, uh, in the sleptonic sector and in the vino vino sector, essentially there is some sort of a compression. So if you take G minus two very seriously, so you look like something like a semi-split, semi-compressed supersymmetry. 
is the kind of spectrum we are looking at actually. So what we have is a compressed weak scale, weakly coupled particles and heavy colored particles. That's the kind of things essentially what we are looking at. Now, if you have heavy supersymmetry, there are two main issues, uh, how to make it natural. So one is issues of fine tuning, and then there are technical issues like uh, precision computation of the spectra and other observers. Okay. So if you have uh, heavy supersymmetry, you can make it natural. So you can have, uh, so I think there are, uh, Jan has looked into it using relaxion ideas essentially. And one can also have something like, you know, uh, multiple sec unse sequestered supersymmetry breaking sectors. This is some sort of a mini landscape essentially inspired by uh, butcher's pulse cream model of landscape. So here you can really reduce the fine tuning. You can in principle make it spect uh, spectrum natural with a uh, factor one by N actually. So a large number of hidden sectors or large number of sequestered sec sectors, you reduce them by one by N actually. These mini landscapes, if you put them in a supergravity framework, uh, in a full supergravity framework, you can actually even solve the supersymmetric flavor problem. You can start with order one flavor violation. And as the number of hidden sectors or the sequestered sectors, yeah. Uh, if they are completely sequestered, if we are completely sequestered, Gravity in the mass is large. Right, exactly. You, 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 yeah, you get an anomaly mediation, but you say you solve it by some mechanism. Here, the, in the present exa example, uh, okay, there are two cases. In one case, if you actually take complete sequestering, you have anomaly mediation everywhere. Essentially, complete sequestering will give you anomaly mediation. Then you have a problem with the gravity nodes. Uh, okay, you have multiple gravity nodes, and so it can overcross the inverse. So you have to impose some sort of R parity violation, so to remove the gravity no problem and everything. So you impose some gravity no violation, so you, you don't make sure that the cosmological problem is solved essentially. In another case, you just use flux like Buchopo Sixteen, so flux based uh, supersymmetry breaking, and then you can have uh, mini landscapes like this essentially. Uh, okay, so here, so you start with order one flavor violation, and you see that uh, there is a root and uh, this is just a statistical factor through which you can solve the flavor problem. You can so in principle, if you have this large uh, mini landscape, you can have prediction in which you can start with ordinary supergravity without trying to solve imposing any flavor symmetry or anything. And then you can have any metric you want, any Keller metric you want, and your flavor problem is solved as long as uh, you have enough number of hidden sectors. So we think this is a novel solution to the supersymmetric flavor problem based on landscape. And these things give you, uh, at the weak scale, very nice spectra. It can satisfy the relic density. They can give you, you know, uh, Cagino conilations, escape the direct detection bounds, and so on. So they are. Uh, some regions are also like uh, uh, focus point regions, which can lead to nice uh, Higgsino dark matter. Uh, okay, uh, where am I? Ten minutes. Okay, uh, in the last uh, ten minutes, I'll just talk about uh, one example of VSM physics without fine tuning. Okay, I mean without solution with fine tuning. So the basic idea here is that you want to replicate whatever all the features which supersymmetry has, but without supersymmetry, okay, without supersymmetry. You don't need a symmetry for the Higgs, okay? So essentially you say that I don't have a symmetry for the Higgs. I don't know how the uh, hierarchy problem is solved, but I have excellent, you know, uh, gauge coupling unification and uh, I can solve all the other problems like dark matter. I can solve neutrino mass problems, all the phenomenological problems, roughly, essentially. So the body idea here is that you add the extra vector fermions at the weak scale, and there are no anomalies. There are no chiral anomalies. They could be having a lot of signals at LHC. 
<clears throat> and they can also, they are actually, I think the next speaker will talk about anomalies in the flavor physics. So uh, you'll, they are used for flavor physics anomalies solving uh, flavor physics anomalies. Now, vector lake formias are omnipresent in many physics beyond standard models like Randall syndrome, composite Higgs, etc. Now, this is a very, very old idea. It's, I think, 1980s, I think, uh, by Rizzo and company, I think. Okay. Um, and uh, after split supersymmetry and its variants, actually, uh, we thought that maybe we can re revisit this idea, this old idea, but with uh, new data because now you have the Higgs. We have the running of the Higgs and so on. So, so the question is whether you can actually uh, make these models stable, the Higgs stable, okay, uh, at even up to the Planck scale and so on. So. so it turns out that you have corrections to the RG equations at two loop uh, through these vector fermions, and you can make them stable all the way up to the Planck scale, essentially, up to the gut scale. And you don't have a lot of uh, uh, freedom because you're asking for explicit uh, exact, uh, meaning gauge coupling precision, gauge coupling unification, stable Higgs, and, the, uh, and so on. So, so if you look at these incomplete representations, essentially, uh, there are very few bunch of models in several copies allowed. And the total number of models which comes out, which gives you uh, the correct proton decay and so on, so are very few actually. Within re, uh, uh, looking at representations up to 75, 75 and SU5 actually. And uh, these give you explicit uh, gauge coupling unification, and you see the mass of these vector fermions to be around the scale essentially. So these are scales of these vector fermions. You have weak scale here, MT, M1, M2, and the guy. Now, if you assume that these new vector fermions do not have any new Yukawa couplings, they don't have any new Yukawa couplings in standard model fermions, these are, they form bound states because all the models, all these models have one colored sector, essentially. All of them have one colored sector. And this colored sector typically, typically uh, uh, is within the range of say around, uh, uh, a few TeV, all of them are within less than five TeV, within two to three TeV, one to two, three TeV, essentially. And so, because it cannot decay through the standard model Yukawa couplings, so what does it form? It forms bound states, essentially. And this uh, bound states decay through uh, either ZZ or gamma Z, gamma gamma, or WW, actually. So you have nice signatures at LHC, and the current bond from gamma gamma put it down. These limits on these bond states are around one TV or so on. So, so these are models which don't have any solution for a natural hierarchy problem, but they have solutions for everything else. They can be incorporated in grand unified theory. Okay. And so, and they have interesting signatures at LHC essentially. These can be. Okay. So, like I said. Uh, there is Vino dark matter, there is minimal dark matter in models, actually, there is heavy neutrino, so on, so essentially. Uh, finally, uh, how much time I have? Five minutes, okay, I'll just talk about uh, G minus <clears> two. <throat> I'm not talking about effective field theories. Uh, these have been, uh, they will be talked by Alex Pomerol in, uh, in the next, uh, in the coming talk, actually. So, but I'll just talk about one thing that if you want to solve G minus two and just have no new physics other than the Higgs, the question is whether you can modify the Higgs couplings a little bit here and there and solve the Higgs uh, um, G minus two essentially. It is possible we use an effective field theory. This is not SM effective, uh, SM effective field theory. This is LEFT, uh, sort of a version of HEFT, a version of HEFT in which uh, you have nonlinear realization of the Higgs and now you have modifications to the Higgs Yukawa, and then you have the da um, Higgs coupling, which is also a free parameter. With this, you have combination of this one loop, two loop, and all these diagrams essentially contributing to the G minus two of the muon at one and two loops. And uh, 
you check that what is the region in which you can really have this uh, uh, imposing the limits actually from the let's see. And so you see, these are the regions in which you can satisfy the G minus two without, uh, with, by modifying, modifying, modifying these couplings of the Higgs and the delta. So the delta modification is very little. The modification of the Higgs is pretty large. Actually, you need to really have this kind of we also check for density results and and so on. So, uh, okay, then uh, okay, I'll skip the clockwork models, which I like very much. Okay, uh, so I'll I'll stop here actually. Okay, yeah, I'm done actually. Yeah. Okay. So we are at the crossroads of the physics beyond standard model. A lot of interesting ideas, and uh, I couldn't cover all of them. Uh, I'll just talk about a few of the, okay, a few of the interesting, and as Jan said this morning, actually, that the discovery of the Higgs and LSE results have made a major impact on traditional BSN models, and we need new ideas and new ideas. Thanks. Sir. Okay, questions and comments? Uh, in that table that you showed of the, of the, uh, vector-like fermions uh, from which you can get unification, right? The, the range of masses was quite, yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. The range of mass is quite narrow. Right. Uh, which I'm a little bit surprised because it's only a logarithmic that depends. It's a logarithmic. Actually, yeah, uh, the range for very precise unification. Right, so, and so if it, you introduce some, some threshold that- The, uh, the thresholds, thresholds will modify. I, I didn't mm -hmm. show those graphs actually, but- Oh. Yeah, if you include some thresholds, there could be high scale thresholds also because these are incomplete representations. So if you include high, high scale thresholds, uh, let me see if I have that. So this range, yeah, is, this is a huge range actually. That, that plot, uh, you cut yeah, it right. at five, but does it continue? Right, it can continue actually, but we stopped at five. Okay. We stopped at just made that choice. Right, right. Uh, so there you talked about uh, these bound states. Right. Okay. So that's when uh, these guys do not have any equal couplings and are long lived. Right. Okay. Right. No, no, they, they annihilate. They annihilate, self annihilate, because these are bound states within. These are bound states. Yeah. Okay. So because if you impose some sort of a Z2 parity, they, they form themselves. Right. But uh, presumably some of the bound states could even live for a little while, right? In principle, yes. It will be like again split supersymmetry. Yes. You can have, uh, yeah. So I'm just wondering whether uh, if they live, they will uh, give rise to something like a R hadron? Uh, so we didn't look at hadrons. We looked at mesons, sort of. These are, these are, these are bone states which are like mesons, essentially. No, what, what I may mean was supposing you yes. have, uh, so yes. these, these come in isospin doublets, right? Right. So I have both uh, charged mesons and uh, neutral mesons. Yeah. So a charged meson as it's traveling, it can exchange a pion with uh, the detector material right. and go to a neutral meson and vice versa. Right. So I that would agree. And uh, we have not explored this in Britain. Okay. Yes. This, this is definitely a possible detection. You can have a uh, mixing between uh, the standard model QCD quark like bound states and uh, these vector like bound states. This is also possible actually, yeah. Okay. You're right. No, 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 no. Okay. This is a, if you want a preliminary, just. I haven't thought about it carefully, but in the vector like fermion models, if your vector like fermions have color charges, then they're going to affect uh, CK measurements. No, they're not mixing with the standard model particles because you don't have equal interactions with the vector like particles with the standard model. If they have, that's a typical detection actually. For all the vector like fermions, the detection is through the Yukawa, through the this thing. But here we just switched off the Yukawa couplings. So imposing some symmetries. And so you have these bound states which are common. Yeah. <laughs> you have heavy like bonds. Right, right, yeah. 
because qcd yeah, yeah, yeah. any other question comment Okay, if not, let us thank Sudhir again.